second time. Um, welcome on behalf of Arbitrator Intelligence. My name is Fahira Brodria. I am the Director of Operations and my colleague Srin Foti, uh, a member of our Board of Directors Advisory Board, um, will be moderating this session with me today. We will cover many important topics, something that's very near and dear to all of our hearts and something that has been an ongoing goal and purpose of, of the work of Arbitrator Intelligence, and that is improving diversity in international arbitration. That is the main goal of this campaign, and we are very happy to be joined today by many partners and supporting organizations and institutions who will discuss with us their best practices and the ways in which they have been working and will continue to work on achieving this very important goal. But one thing we want to leave you with after this session today is a very concrete and very specific way in which you can contribute, maybe even during the session, maybe afterwards, things that you can do that are within your reach and that you hold within your hands to uh, take concrete steps towards diversity in international arbitration. So we will hear a lot about this from all our wonderful speakers today. I will now hand over to my colleague Shireen uh, to give you the introduction of our participants and then we will kick off an amazing discussion. You are very welcome to ask questions. You're very, very welcome to give us your input and ideas that we can take away with us from today. So Shireen, please take it away. Thanks so much, Sarah. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending where you are in the world. Um, we're delighted to have you all here today with us uh, for this event, which is part of our Diversity Campaign 2021. Um, we, as Fahira mentioned, we're delighted to have the support of quite a number of um, institutional and organizational representatives who are here with us today, which you see on your screen. Um, this campaign has sought to be as inclusive as possible for the common purpose of really furthering the objective of actually seeing some tangible change um, in the question of diversity and representation um, in the field of our international arbitration. So we are really delighted to have um, all of this uh, incredible support from these various organizations and institutions. So without uh, further ado, I'll briefly introduce the speakers today who will be contributing their thoughts, ideas, uh, insights and uh, suggested courses of action to you. Um, we are really happy to have them all here today. So first I'll start um, in the order that I have them here. So Catherine Rogers, of course, is um, the, the founder of Arbitrator Intelligence. She's here today in that capacity. Of course, a number of our speakers here wear multiple hats, but today I will introduce them by their affiliated organization um, whom they are representing. We also have uh, Dana McGrath representing Arbitral Women. Uh, we have Ashley Jones representing the Arbitration Pledge, the ERA Pledge. We have Obaro Omatseye, I hope I pronounced that correctly, from LASIAC, yeah. the La Lagos yeah. Chamber of Commerce International Arbitration Center in Nigeria. Um, we have Katarina Piskunovic, I hope I also pronounced that correctly, of the uh, Russian Arbitration Center at the Russian Institute of Modern Arbitration. We are also joined by Victoria Kig Kigen, Kigen of uh, the Rising Arbitrators Initiative. Uh, we also have Eva Litina of Real, the racial, e racial Equality for Arbitration Lawyers, Michelle Sonen of SIAC, the Singapore International Arbitration Center, Navruza Yunusova, Yunusova excuse me, of uh, the Tashkent International Arbitration Center, and lastly, Veronica Sandler of Women Way in, in Arbitration, WWA Latham. So we are, um, and of course, uh, we must say thank you to um, Kirsten, who has been instrumental in organizing this event as well, so from behind the scenes. Um, as you see, we have a, a stellar panel here. We're really interested to hear their insights, and um, we, we want to emphasize that uh, in organizing this diversity campaign, we sought to collaborate across various um, factors which uh, help people in identifying diversity in arbitration. So we have representatives who represent racial diversity, gender diversity, age diversity, amongst other others. Um, and we, we sought to do that specifically in order to have this campaign be as inclusive as possible. So without further ado, I'll, I'll turn it back over um, to Fahira to, to begin the, the discussion. 
Thank you very much, Shireen. Um, I will not delay further. We are all here today under the auspices of our diversity campaign. So before we can kick off uh, any further discussion, it would be good to share some details about what prompted the campaign, what is our diversity campaign all about, and why is diversity in arbitral appointments so important for all the stakeholders in international arbitration, whether we are talking about the parties in council, the institutions and organizations. And Catherine will share with you some of these general ideas and key points that will help us frame the discussion further. So Catherine, please take it away. Okay, so I think now you can see my uh, slides. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Good. Yes. Okay, so, um, so first I wanted to start with saying how uh, humble, I didn't even realize how much until I saw everyone on the screen, uh, it's, it's really exciting to see so many organizations come together in, in support of something that we've been working on so long and so hard. So thank you to all the representatives, the organizations, and for you all for tuning in uh, to what's for us a very special moment. So this is a slightly different perspective on diversity than sometimes is talked about. Um, we know that uh, certain organizations essentially identified and raised awareness about the lack of diversity and different forms of diversity. We know that several uh, organizations came up with really interesting toolkits and tools to try and nudge people towards uh, appointing more diverse arbitrators. Arbitrator intelligence was founded very much on the idea that one big part of the problem that's not discussed enough is a very practical problem that even if someone wants to appoint a diverse arbitrator, it's really difficult because of the lack of information. So here's what our market looks like. It's a very unusual market for arbitrators, right? Tiny, tiny amount of publicly available cases. As a result, what we end up doing is looking for personal referrals because people don't just appoint an arbitrator based on an impressive resume. There are a lot of soft skills and also experience and not just generic experience, but particularized experience in cases they wanna know about. And so now, because most of the cases are silent, they look to personal referrals for that. But what you really need to appoint the right arbitrator is what's under the surface. And arbitrator intelligence was founded on the idea that if we don't know what's going on in the vast majority of cases, it creates a sort of natural monopoly for the first arrivers who tended to be white males, right? Because if you can't look below the water surface, you're always just gonna reappoint those who are accessible through personal referrals. So what did we do to try and fix that? We've created a platform that enables essentially the sharing of information, people who have it and people who need it, but through an anonymized and confidential platform. So we don't ask for any information that is confidential about the case, the identities of the parties and the, and the uh, individuals providing the information are maintained as confidential, but we can collect it systematically and make sure everyone has access to this. This is extremely important for diverse arbitrators and examples I hear all the time. When I was in Madrid just last week, an arbitrator told me she had an arbitration that was really hard. The losing party wrote to the institution to say, nevertheless, she did a great job. I said, that's great. Now the institution knows, but no one else in the world um, knows what a great job she did. So the platform that we created is actually a survey and we ask details, non-confidential details about the case. Um, you can find more information about the survey, which we call the Arbitrator Intelligence Questionnaire or AIQ on our website. We have a whole bunch of uh, question and answer there. Um, but what I wanna do is to talk a little bit more in closing about this idea of uh, personal referrals and why it limits diversity. They've actually done research in academic settings to show uh, that uh, the people who come to your mind, uh, there are a number of different essentially cognitive biases, not biases against particular groups or individuals, but just kind of habits that we have. Uh, and we tend to reach for the names that are most accessible, the ones that are most familiar to us. And if the people who are in the highest levels of power in law firms, which generally historically have tended to be uh, white males, um, they think of the ones who are most obvious to them, they tend to be white males. But we believe even though there have been many pushes to get people to put onto their short lists um, diverse individuals, and I think there's been a great deal of progress, not enough there. Um, the problem is that if you need a personal referral to take that arbitrator from the short list and get them on the tribunal, okay, we have to change the way this referral information, this background information about an arbitrator's actual experience in arbitrations, how it's collected and how it's shared. And that's what arbitrator intelligence does. We think it has another, a number of other benefits for diversity. 
Uh, number one, I don't think diversity is only about arbitrators, it's about law firms. I think that we enable smaller law firms that don't have an extensive network for referrals to actually get quality information about arbitrators outside their networks. We also provide our AIQ in multiple languages, more coming soon, um, because diversity is also about meeting people where they are and not assuming that all important arbitration happens in the English language uh, and on the terms of North America and Western Europe. So we're extremely excited about what's been going on in the diversity campaign. The number one thing we're asking you to do, and we'll come back towards the end, is to share your feedback with us on diverse arbitrators. And again, we'll come back to that at the end. With that, I'm gonna stop here so we can hear comments uh, and feedback from others. Yes, thank you very much, Catherine. And uh, that was a very succinct way of, of elaborating something that's very detailed and something that really is consequential and in practice. So uh, we do appreciate this input, but I'm sure all of our guests will have a lot to say and as well as other participants. Before we go into some details about what different institutions and organizations have been doing recently, it might be good to kind of take stock of the actual progress that has been made and, and the way that the community of international arbitration has recognized, but then also jointly uh, undertaken several efforts to uh, change the perception of diversity and increase the stakes when it comes to ensuring diversity in international arbitration. So maybe Dana, um, would you just like to give us a general idea about your perception and how do you see these changing trends and then just how much the arbitration uh, community has adopted this new perception. Yes, um, hi, I'm Dana McGrath. Good morning from New York. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm president of Arbitral Women and we are a global, global organization that promotes women around the world um, in many different roles of arbitration, including as arbitrator, counsel, expert in many other roles. And we have observed with pleasure, the increasing representation of women in the arbitration space, um, while recognizing that there's much more work to be done. And um, it's important also to, uh, to, to look not just at gender, but to look at all different facets of diversity. And so I applaud arbitration, arbitrator intelligence and everyone here today who is really expending a lot of energy and um, and time and personal commitment to the values I think we all share to increase diversity in arbitration in all facets. Um, and so we have been pleased to see the increasing representation of women. Um, we applaud the arbitral institutions in the first instance who I think have taken um, substantial steps towards that, as well as many of the organizations represented here today. And I think it's the collaboration across our organizations that has empowered all of us to actually move the needle in the last five to 10 years, far more than we have in years past. So Arbitral Women is a, an organization with more than 25 years of history. We've been promoting women for decades, but it is really with the collaboration of all of us and all of the people who are affiliated with or supporters of our organizations that have made it possible to actually achieve change. And so I'll leave it to the institutions to describe a little bit how they have uh, individually uh, tried to achieve change or examples and circle back on later on what Arbitral Women does to try to increase the visibility of our members and to allow the arbitration community to see the underrepresented members of, uh, of the community and have them more front of mind to help overcome some of those biases that Catherine mentioned earlier. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to someone else and happy to talk about what we do uh, more specifically later in the program. Thank you so much, Dana, for that um, introduction to Arbitral Women and uh, explanation of the, the cross um, uh, the cross support that we really see between different organizations and, and the way that that has had an impact uh, on, on affecting change in the field. Um, uh, now I'd like to turn to uh, our various institutional representatives to get their comments on what specifically they are doing internally, um, what their internal processes are for taking diversity into consideration and attempting to um, 
push the needle in, in favor of more diverse uh, appointments. Um, one thing we hear quite often is that institutions are really at the forefront of um, pushing for diversity, more so than parties, more so than council themselves. It's uh, perhaps institutions that have that ability and the resources and tools necessary to be able to, um, to push things in that direction. And we often see the statistics of institutions which uh, reflect uh, their efforts towards moving uh, towards greater diversity in appointments. Um, so we'd be very interested to hear from our institutional representatives here, what exactly are the internal processes that you implement um, in order to appoint arbitrators that are diverse? Uh, how exactly, um, you know, what, what, is, what is the representation and, and how many um, individuals or, or numbers generally uh, are you succeeding in, in, uh, in putting into place in, 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 in party appointed, um, but also institutional appointed arbitrators, which are diverse. And how do you define diversity, of course, um, taking into account gender, age, uh, ge geographical location, race, um, how do you go about engaging in that process? And what obstacles really do you face uh, when you're doing that? So we'd be very interested to hear, perhaps we can start with um, Ekaterina from Iraq, from the Russian Arbitration Center, uh, and then um, maybe Michelle, you can you step in on behalf of SIAC, uh, and then we'll, we'll go to the others on the panel. Thank you, and good afternoon from Moscow to everyone. And first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, this opportunity to speak on such a topical issue of diversity in the arbitrator's appointments. But before I go into the Russian Arbitration Center's experience, I would like uh, to point out how important it is to understand the baseline from which we start to deal with this problem. By this, I mean uh, the understanding of cultural differences, which may uh, affect uh, the further developments in all areas, including the arbitration. So taking Russia, for example, we see that historically women participated almost equally in the workforce. However, we see a huge discrepancy uh, among the leadership positions between men and women. Also, we see uh, statistically that women gain one third less than, people, uh, than men do. So uh, this mere cultural fact uh, directly impacts the um, uh, appointment procedure as, for example, it is a common practice to appoint arbitrators from the law firm heads and their practices. Thus, from the very beginning, we have a shorter list of candidates and thus we have to put more effort to um, rebalance the situation. So um, in terms of the arbitral institution, what can we do and what do we do is that, uh, first of all, we have internal regulations uh, that are transmitted to every employee of the administrative office and we take different uh, factors into account when we select the short list of candidates. So these factors include gender, age, uh, geographical location and the legal background as well. So, um, and in regard to the Russian Arbitration Center, it is of big importance as we have the uh, default rule that the, it is for the institution to appoint the arbitrator as a default and um, unless the parties agree otherwise. And we see that this works in 70% of the cases. So we feel our responsibility uh, to affect this matter. And um, in regard to the statistics, what we see now is that, um, during the five years of our experience, we have the average 34% uh, of the women participation uh, in arbitration as arbitrators. Uh, but for example, this year we see a number heights, uh, 41% so far. Of course, it is not ideal as we don't have the complete equality. So there is a lot of uh, place to improve. But uh, in terms to the other, uh, diversity factors, uh, we have uh, around 30% of the young arbitrators up to 45 years old. We uh, have a big discrepancy uh, between the uh, geographical locations as around 60% uh, of arbitrators coming, are coming from Moscow. So we try to uh, rebalance and take this into account, of course, uh, in accordance with the exercise of the arbitrators. So what we do in this regard, when we come up with a short list of candidates, 
we um, include the our search uh, even outside of our recommended list. So we uh, suggest candidates, we search for them, um, taking this gender, age, and other factors. Um, also, what we can do is to show our personal example. And uh, for example, the administrative office uh, staff consists uh, of two thirds of the female uh, employees and um, the head of our institution is a female. So uh, we think this is a, a good way to transmit our values in every way where we engage. Um, also what we have uh, been doing actively is collaborating with different relevant organizations and initiatives as the arbitrator intelligence the, uh, we have been the first permanent arbitral institution in Russia to join the equal representation in arbitration. We also uh, are partnering arbitral women and uh, Russian women in arbitration and different other initiatives. Uh, so um, what also we are thinking of, and we believe that this is very important to uh, shift the, uh, to make the systematic shifts uh, in the perception. And this way, um, we try to engage into different educational and informational programs and projects. We um, try to develop the um, regions in Russia as well, as we see uh, there is a strong inclination toward Moscow, but we try to uh, rebalance this as well. We also uh, have different mood courts, domestic and international, well, or, or international ones. So uh, trying to engage as many professionals as possible, both on the side of the students, the future uh, practitioners, and on the side of the um, arbitrators. And uh, what else? We do the publication of the awards to somehow uh, show uh, the expertise of the diverse arbitrators. I think it is of great importance and um, also the informational agenda is, of course, uh, number one priority as we are doing now. And I think this webinar is a perfect way to exchange our experiences for the benefits of everyone here and uh, outside. So I think this is all for us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katarina, um, for those uh, important insights on, on the operations of the, the REC. Um, perhaps now we can turn to Michelle Sonnen of SIAC. And, and Michelle, in addition to uh, discussing those relevant points for your institution, what we'd also be interested in hearing about is how do you ensure that, you know, once someone is on a short list, um, how do they then transition to actually a, being appointed as an arbitrator? Because we, we see a lot of uh, listing of names and even in, from a council perspective, um, wearing my council hat, we, we are very happy to put lots of names on a list. But in the end, how do you actually ensure that someone is going to be nominated and appointed by the institution as an arbitrator? How do you ensure that process? Sure. Um, well, first of all, thank everyone for, for being here and thank you to Arbitrator Intelligence for inviting SIC and inviting me to be here. Um, greetings everyone from Seoul where I am based and it's, um, it's actually a good night, just about 10.30 p.m. <laughs> um, and I also want to echo sentiments of, of previous speakers and applaud just the work that all of your respective organizations have done in advancing gender diversity, racial diversity, um, you know, all the different forms of diversity. And I'm really excited to be a part of this panel and help contribute to, to this dialogue. Um, I also I just wanted to point out with arbitrator intelligence in particular, um, I, I love the efforts to sort of pull back the curtain, you know, uh, in appointments and enhance transparency, diversity, accountability, and I just think it's a really wonderful initiative. Um, so what is SIAC doing? Um, you know, we have made really deliberate, intentional efforts to enhance the diversity of our arbitrator appointments. Um, so this of course includes diversity across gender, nationality, age, ethnicity, backgrounds, um, and so on. And you know, with unconscious bias, implicit biases playing the role that it does um, in our culture, it's very important um, to take deliberative deliberate and proactive steps. So I think that's that's the starting point. It has to be deliberate and it has to be proactive. 
Um, and, you know, we've seen the heartening thing is that we've seen more di- significantly more diversity and the result has been better, more representative arbitrations. They're run better and they reflect a wider perspective of viewpoints. Um, and I think that at, for SIC, for us, that is really the ultimate goal, that our arbitrators reflect or match our diverse user base. Um, and that is the goal that we're trying to meet. So in terms of our internal process, um, when we make, when SIC does appointments, institutional appointments, it's actually a very simple, only two-step process. The, um, the secretariat recommends, you know, comes up with the short list. Um, and then that list goes to the appointing authority, which under our rules is the president and the vice president of the SIAC court. Um, and it is our absolute practice to include diverse arbitrators in the list, in the short list that goes up to the appointing authorities. Um, and then one great thing about SIC is how committed uh, the president and the vice president of the court are in also promoting diversity. So they have come back to us on occasion and said, it's not diverse enough, we need more. Um, and that and that's really encouraging and, and that's great. And I think um, that, you know, to, to answer your question about how to get from the short list to the actual appointment, um, I think that's that's one answer with respect to institutional appointments. The appointing, the, the actual person with the appointing authority has to be on board with you. Um, so yes, I see we're very fortunate to have our presidents and vice presidents be strong promoters of diversity. And I don't know if we all saw the news, but we are so lucky to have Lucy Reed coming on as president of the SIC court starting, I believe today. Um, well, it depends what time zone you're in. <laughs> but, um, you know, she's been such a staunch advocate for diversity, of course, trailblazer, pioneer. And I'm personally very excited to, to see the work, um, you know, that will continue with, with Lucy at the helm. So I think, you know, d- 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 having diverse people behind the institution, having diverse people sort of with the authority to, to make the ultimate decision is going to be a key part of um, going from the short list to the actual appointment. And that's something we're very conscious of at, at SIC. Um, you know, we also have a female CEO, our registrar is female, a, a bit, great number of us working at SIC are female um, and so, and uh, female women of color as well. So I think that's all going to contribute to, to the decisions that are getting made. Um, okay, so how are we finding the diverse arbitrators? I know that that's, that's always a question. Um, and, you know, we, we need a bigger tent of diverse arbitrators worldwide, right? It's not simply repeat appointments of the same handful of diverse arbitrators. Um, and reality is that we spend an enormous amount of time picking arbitrators. <laughs> um, it's, it's, uh, it's not difficult in the sense that, you know, it's, it's hard to do. It's just that, um, you know, you want, it's difficult, it, you know, you want to broaden the tent as much as possible. Um, and so we spend a lot of time really carefully thinking about who the right person is going to be and trying to look beyond just your, you know, the, the people that immediately come to mind um, to sort of think about new people who are new people that we can appoint, um, help give people first time appointments. Um, help ensure that the list is diverse. Um, Let's see. So, and I think one heartening thing as well in terms of enhancing diversity is that with the demographics of young practitioners today, um, the fact is that the more you're appointing first-time appointees, they tend to be more diverse just because of how global arbitration has really become. Um, The, you know, the young practitioners today um, reflect a very diverse body of people. And so, you know, when you're appointing more first time appointees, um, they do tend to be more diverse. So that is encouraging as well. Um, <clears throat> so how to make it, how to make it on the list? Well, for one, we do have a reserve panel um, for up and coming arbitrators for people who don't yet meet our main criteria. Um, and we always encourage new people to, to apply for that, um, including diverse candidates um, who may not yet meet the requirements for the main panel. Um, we will encourage 
uh, application to, to the reserve panel as well. And we very, very frequently actually do appoint from the reserve panel. So it's not just like a throwaway list, you know, <laughs> um, we, we do actually use it. Um, but another really important source for us in finding new and diverse arbitrators is um, looking at the work of counsel, the people that are acting as counsel in SIAC arbitrations. Um, because we have such a robust scrutiny process where we really review draft awards, we, play very, we pay very close attention to the proceedings. And so when a young counsel repeatedly does well, um, that's something we pay attention to and we keep in mind um, for future appointments as well. So we do often make off-panel appointments and when we do, often one place that we're getting candidates is based on work that they have done as counsel in SIC arbitration. Um, another benefit of scrutiny is that we are really deeply informed um, of the performance of an arbitrator in a case. Um, and so, you know, some when we have first time appointments or people who are not appointed that often, um, but yet we can see how well that they have conducted the case, um, then we can appoint again and again and again with confidence. Um, because we are aware, deeply informed of the work that they have done because we so closely watch, watch the case because um, we're kind of required to do so in our scrutiny process. Um, the other thing is that we have to be tuned in to the community. You know, as a leading institution, it's really our role, it's our job to know who the up and coming arbitrators are, who the, you know, who the talent council are um, and to be able to, to give them appointments when the right case comes up. And I think this is where uh, the symbiotic relationship comes into play with, with organizations like um, you know, Rising Arbitrators Initiative, Real Arbitral Women and so forth um, to help you know, show us who, who we need to be looking at um, that maybe we, not, we hadn't seen yet. Um, so that's, that's very important as well. Um, the other thing I just would want to quickly highlight is, um, is uh, building up your profile, right? That's another great way to get, um, to get appointments, to sort of get yourself out there. And one thing that SIC is doing in that area is not only are we proactive, with our arbitrator appointments, but with our speaking opportunities. Um, and just like we spend an enormous time, amount of time picking arbitrators, we actually do spend an enormous amount of time picking speakers for our events um, because we're always trying to find new people and make sure that we're giving people um, a platform to sort of build up their profiles as well. So I think um, I have been told I'm out of time. <laughs> so I will end there for now. Thank you so much, Michelle. Very insightful and, and uh, very interesting to hear how, how things are operating behind the scenes uh, there at, at SISC. Um, perhaps now we can return. We can turn to um, to. Sorry, I'm not seeing. I was going to turn to Lasiak next, but I guess we'll go to uh, TIAC to Navruza. Um, we'd be re really interested to hear also um, your position on. Uh, what Michelle touched upon and what Catherine touched upon earlier, the idea that, um, you know, appointing arbitrators, diverse arbitrators is very hard work. Uh, and, you know, perhaps there's something missing in this whole equation, which it, 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 perhaps it shouldn't be so difficult. Um, what, what exactly do you, what is your experience in, uh, at, T, at TIAC and how um, would, what are you missing? You know, what, are, what is missing in your daily process to be able to do this with greater ease? Um, but please go ahead and touch upon also the other points raised earlier. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shireen, and thank you for having me today. So um, before describing the internal process, how the arbitrators are appointed at the TIAC, I would like to tell you more about the statistics of arbitral appointments at our institution. So TIAC uh, is an institution that has made very strong and concerted effort to promote diversity in its appointments. And this diversity comes in many forms, not only in terms of gender, but also geography, ethnicity, nationality, age, and many other factors. Um, despite of the fact that TIAC is a very young institution, it was established only in the year of 2018 and was launched during Paris Arbitration Week in 2019. As of today, we have received 24 requests for arbitration and two applications for emergency relief. 
And in terms of geography of parties involved in those cases, it, it spans over multiple jurisdictions, including China, Hong Kong, Italy, Russia, Moldova, Turkey, Singapore, Philippines, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and many more. And accordingly, uh, the geography of appointed arbitrators in those cases involve with arbitrators from diverse jurisdictions, from wide CIS region, Europe, and Middle East. And in terms of gender diversity, approximately 40% of appointed arbitrators were female. And if you talk about the numbers uh, of uh, the age of the arbitrators, majority of arbitrators appointments were either 55 years old or younger. Very illustrative case that uh, shows clearly our uh, efforts on diversifying the arbitrator's appointments is our recent sport case. So out of three arbitrators, one is female and one is under the age of 45 years old. This demonstrate that also being very young, TX efforts to diversify arbitral appointments has given some of the results. So also TIAC promotes diversity, not only during the process of appointment, but at the very initial stages, um, at the time when the TIAC's list of arbitrators panel and resource panel of arbitrators is formed. And if you look into the list of arbitrators on our website, you will see how diverse it is. So if you talk about the appointment process itself, this is the decision primarily made by the parties. Uh, as we know, the arbitration is the product of consent, and this is the right and power of parties of a dispute to nominate arbitrators. In cases when the party does not want to exercise its power of appointment, it can be delegated to TIAC. And here, what is important is that this function is performed by TIAC Court of Arbitration. Here, TIAC Secretariat is, uh, has the function to collect the preferences of parties of the dispute and form the shortlist of three recommended names and propose them to the TIA Court of Arbitration. Notably, TIA Court has discretion to select arbitrators from this list or outside this recommended list. And while performing the task of coming up with the shortlist, starting this September, TIAC Secretariat makes the use of the TIAC Arbitrator Diversity Checklist. And this checklist has been developed by the TIAC 45, which is the group of young arbitration practitioners. This checklist comprises the questions that needs to be answered by the TIAC Secretariat in conjunction with the TIAC court before making the appointment. There are 18 questions that can be divided into categories such as arbitrator's skill set, arbitrator's educational background, arbitrator's background itself, and case related questions. Arbitrator's skill set include the questions about the language of arbitration, arbitration, uh, the, the practical experience of arbitrator, how many arbitral appointments uh, she or he had specific experience in sports, commercial, investment treaty, IP or IT arbitration, depending on the subject of the case. Educational background includes um, the questions concerning bar admissions, where the arbitrator was educated, does arbitrator has specialized training that is required for this dispute. Third group of questions include more personal questions such as age, gender, and disability. And the last group of questions concerns the specifics of the case, whether it's an expedited proceeding, what is the value of the case, and etc. And for example, for lower value cases, TX Secretariat might recommend younger and less experienced arbitrators. These questions facilitate the TIAC Secretariat to recommend more diverse arbitrators to the TIA Court of Arbitration. And based on these recommendations, the court makes its own check of arbitrators and finally appoints one for a case. 
So I think this is it from my side concerning the process, how arbitrators are appointed at TIAC and a little bit of our statistics. So thank you. Thank you so much, Navruza, for those uh, comments. Very interesting. And uh, perhaps we can discuss uh, later on in the in the program a bit more about the checklist and the idea of uh, implementing certain set of criteria that you would apply in, in ensuring that diverse arbitrators are appointed. So thank you for contributing that. Um, so lastly, um, we'll move to our last institutional representative, uh, Obaro Omatseye from uh, LASIAC. Uh, and Obaro, perhaps you can comment on um, you know, the points that we've mentioned earlier about what specifically LASIAC is doing to ensure the appointment of diverse arbitrators and specifically how you ensure that diversity moves not simply you know, from a, a list of a short list, but to actual appointments and what LASIAC is doing in that respect. Obaro, can you uh, can you hear us? I think she may be frozen. Okay. Well, perhaps we can turn over then, uh, Fahira, um, to to the next topic, and then uh, once once uh, her technical difficulties end, we can come back to her. Yes, it's it's really a shame, unfortunately. But as soon as you are back, Obaro, if you can hear us, uh, we would love to hear your input as well. Um, but uh, with this context of what the institutions are doing, and obviously there's so much being done, um, and very consciously, so I mean, very consistently, as Michelle noted, um, there's also a lot to be done on the side of the parties. And this is where different initiatives and organizations come in, because they have a membership that consists of more than just institutional representatives, but they also gather practitioners in a broader sense. And obviously there has to be a cohesive action in order to have specific results that are tangible and meaningful. So luckily today with us, we have many representatives of very successful initiatives. Um, so maybe we can open up with uh, Veronica uh, from Women Work in Arbitration. Uh, we know that you have some very interesting initiatives. So which ones would you emphasize as the most effective so far ongoing in the, in the area of diversity? Thank you so much, Fahinia. Well, uh, my name is Verica Sandler, and on behalf of Women Way and Arbitration, it's a real pleasure to participate in this seven and of course in the Arbitrator Intelligent Campaign. Congratulations. Well, uh, first of all, I think it's important to, uh, to talk about the, the mission of Women Way and Arbitration. Our mission at Women Way and Arbitration is principally to give Latin American women involved in arbitration a forum to feel that they are not alone, where we can share our goals and frustrations and help each other. We don't focus exclusively on potential women arbitration. We urge women to become expert and counsel. So we welcome not only your lawyers, but also financial advisors, engineers, and accountants. We offer a forum, one-to-one -one contact. And we have mainly so, uh, sponsored the questionnaire and networking events. And there we can show a different perspective for women in Latin America arbitration, that they can uh, share his experience, war stories and ideas, and how to push women to consider an arbitration and counsel or experts. In particular, we, uh, with your question here, I would uh, think that the, in this uh, reasoning, I think that the most important action that we are uh, working uh, nowadays in, in, in women way arbitration is that we have concluded cooperation agreements with different uh, arbitrary institutions, such as La Cámara de Comercio de Lima uh, in Peru, such as uh, El Centro de Arbitraje de México, uh, La CAM, the Cámara de Arbitraje y Mediación de Santiago de Chile, and the Centro Internacional de Arbitraje de Madrid for Spain. We prepared and we delivered some uh, lists of some, arbitration, some women arbitration, Latin America, of course, arbitration and counsel. And they use this list, we provide this list with some uh, names for expert or counsel to use as the institution uh, may see fit. Of course, this list is to provide new names and uh, maybe try to show the different uh, person that in Latin America is a perfect uh, suite for the, 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 nom the nomination of the work that uh, they are calling. 
So I think that this is one of the most important actions that we are working uh, nowadays. But of course, we have a lot of activities, different activities involved to uh, this uh, mission that I mentioned, that is to try to uh, create a, a forum, a place that women from Latin America can, uh, can show his experience. And we try to find a way to use like a vitrine or vitrina, as we say in, in Spanish, a place that the, uh, they can show and they can appear in the sun. So thank you so much. And then we can talk about a uh, different uh, other perspective and ideas that we can win education is for. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, Shireen, do you want to take over? I think we have Obaro back. Yes, Obaro's back. Thank you, Fahira. Um, hey. Obaro, I think you heard the question earlier. So uh, yes, I did. If you I did. Could, yeah, if you can go ahead on behalf of last year, and then we'll come back to the, the organizations. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I had some network issues. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Obaro Mashaye. It's, it's indeed a pleasure today to be here to represent Lagos Chamber of Commerce. International Arbitration Center in Lagos, Nigeria on this webinar. Indeed, I must commend the organizers for stirring this very important conversation on assessing and resolving disparities in arbitrator appointment. Uh, as we have seen, indeed, uh, there is an increasing gender and ethnicity diversity in arbitral tribunals. It's not just a valid concern right now, but it's actually the need for the hour. It's something we should be discussing. So I must commend uh, Arbitrator Intelligence for organizing this and for giving us the opportunity to be part of this. Uh, we see uh, all, about, uh, all, all across the world, we see that women are still underrepresented, despite the knowledge that gender balance, leadership, it's actually an, uh, actually improving corporate governance all about the world. Uh, for us as an institution in La SIAC, we maintain a list of diverse neutrals ranging from uh, experienced uh, arbitrators to those with little or no experience in terms of appointment. The process of uh, shortlisting or appointing a candidate uh, to be listed on the LASIAC panel of neutrals is done by the election committee of the LASIAC courts. Uh, our courts maintains a very fair and unbiased process in the selection process. For instance, I'll give you a practical example. If we had to shortlist three to four can, uh, candidates or uh, applicants or arbitrators or mediators for parties to recommend, we would normally take into consideration to ensure that we have first, there's a gender balance. Secondly, we ensure that uh, the person on the list uh, or one or two persons on the list fits the diversity policy as regards to age. Then lastly, we would consider, uh, I think maybe the fourth person on the list uh, depending on the experience and the nature of the case and the expertise required for that particular case. But we must all uh, take into the fact that the final appointment uh, is subject to the recommendations by the parties. Of course, we would not uh, impose anyone on you. We would pick the best minds, uh, give you uh, the list, and of course you make your choice. But sometimes uh, giving the parties such power to choose an arbitrator, we, re we recognize this as a challenge because uh, most times parties don't necessarily understand the importance diversity plays in the quality and legitimacy of the arbitral proceedings. So you find situations like, instead of looking into the different insights or perspectives, uh, a diverse arbitrator would bring to the case, you see parties choosing people who they are more familiar with, or maybe someone who is more famous in handling uh, a particular case or who they know you know, as a subject matter may require. Well, but as an institution, what are we doing to ensure that, you know, uh, there's not just one particular person that keeps getting the job all the time? We, um, uh, on our panel, we ensure we have a good mix of diversity ranging from age, uh, nationality, experience, and sector. We um, project such uh, persons on our panel by creating a detailed comprehensive selling point for everyone. We, uh, of course, boost your profile and make you uh, more unique so you stand, uh, you have a fair equal chance at being appointed. Uh, recently, in recognizing this, I think about a month ago, LASIAC decided to update uh, the process of application uh, for persons who wanted to be listed on our panel. Panel. So we have upgraded our system to include some sort of 
uh, a filtration. So where we have our court members, where we have parties come to us and say, okay, we have a case and uh, can you recommend an arbitrator or a mediator from your panel of neutrals? So how does the uh, systematic filtration work? So it's um, it has uh, a place, but of course it's not uh, open to the public in terms of the search. The, uh, the tool is basically for the court members. So if you want to get, uh, if you want someone who is from Ghana or who is from the UK or a uh, Canada. In terms of uh, experience, we have a box where you fill the application. If you are three years and above uh, in terms of your practice in arbitration, you you click that. Then we have uh, also a column for people who are five years and above and people who are 10 years and above. Then we also created different sectors. So we have people who are in the energy sector. We have uh, people who come on our panel and of course, uh, who have little or no experience at all. So there's also a place for them. Uh, but in a couple of weeks, uh, this platform is going to be live on our LASIAC website and it's open to the public uh, uh, for those seeking to be listed on the LASIAC panel of neutrals. So the purpose of having this new filtration system that we have is not just to, uh, I mean, it acts as a check and balance for our court members. So there's no favoritism of uh, any particular person you know, so that everyone stands a fair chance of having uh, been appointed. So on our panel, we have uh, people who range from the age of 30 to 50. Uh, we have people who are just coming out of school. We have, of course, people who are well experienced in 10 years. So how does this system actually work? So if you want an arbitrator who is experienced, if you're handling an energy case, you uh, go to the search button, you click, okay, I want an arbitrator or who is from the Netherlands and who is uh, who has 10 years experience in energy. So when you click on that button, the system automatically pulls up the data of everyone who had initially, while filling the application form, filled those uh, specific criteria in their bio data page. So that way, I mean, the court members are kept uh, in checks and balance and, you know, who... In fact, we just feel like you give the job to who's best suitable for the job. So having this filtration system kind of eliminates the process of, uh, you know, having to choose a popular arbitrator known to you over another person. So it's basically what the party wants. So if the party comes to you and says, oh, no, I think a younger person can handle this. I want someone three years experience in the banking sector. We just go um, to the portal. OK, three years experience, banking sector, whoever it pulls up, that person automatically gets the case. So that's how it works in last year. But as regards to diversity, uh, last year, we uh, uh, launched a campaign called the Road, excuse me, the Roadmap. <clears throat> our standing for our new rules that we just introduced, then O, because we recently launched an online dispute resolution platform. Then A was for the Afri uh, Africa division and uh, D was for diversity. We realized that, uh, I mean, in our arbitral institution, we, it was mainly male dominated. So right now on the board of LASIAC, our chairman is a woman. Our vice chairman is a woman. On the board of directors, uh, we have about seven women ranging from 32 to 50. So there's a balance and we understand that this change has to start from within as an organization. So we have the uh, that stemming from the top to the bottom. If we have events, we make sure that we also allow our students, uh, members participate in such events, you know, to just keep it, um, you know, to make everyone included in the process. So in terms of the selection of panel of neutrals, uh, we are making it as transparent as can be. So uh, it goes to the best man for the job, depending on your expertise as required for the case. Thank you so much, uh, Obaro. This is uh, very interesting. We'll come back to some of these points in the end, uh, the questions of, uh, in, you know, internally having leadership representing uh, the diversity that you seek to emulate, the use of lists, the use of filtration techniques, um, the use of internal criteria. All of this is, is really fascinating and I think uh, contributing very much to institution success and, and moving towards greater diversity. But we'll come back to those points later. Thank you so much for all of your contributions and Fahira, perhaps we can turn to the Thank next uh, organizational representative in the interest of time. Yes, yes, of course. Thank you very much, uh, Obaro, and thank you, Shireen. Uh, what we have heard so far shows a lot of hard work goes into the appointment of diverse arbitrators, and one really missing uh, element, or as we called it recently, the missing link is this 
anecdotal information, the direct feedback, the people who have seen them in action, all of these things could complement these lists so well and help you make the decision easier to appoint a more diverse arbitrator. Now, one initiative that we are all well aware of and one that's often cited as, as a huge success is the Equal Representation and Arbitration Pledge. Um, and the arbitration community has accepted it with both hands, understanding that it's important to express your commitment as well. Um, so we'll be happy to hear from Ashley. Uh, what have you been doing recently and how do you think party feedback can factor into this pledge and this commitment? What do you think that uh, can arise out of it concretely now going forward? Thanks, Sahira. Hello, everyone. Um, and thank you to uh, Arbitration Intelligence for organizing this webinar, first of all, and for inviting me to join this fantastic panel. Pledge is very delighted to support this um, important campaign. Um, so as most of you know, the um, ERA Pledge was launched in 2016 um, and now has nearly 5,000 signatories. Um, the pledge calls on participants in the international arbitration system, including parties, council, arbitrators and institutions, to commit to improving the profile and representation of women in arbitration, including by ensuring that the concrete steps listed in the pledge are adhered to whenever possible. Following an initial awareness raising phase, um, securing signatories, um, the pledge, I'd say, has now moved on to a, an imp a more implementation phase to help members of the arbitral community to abide by their commitments in the pledge, specifically to be able to or to facilitate them to increase the number of female arbitrator appointments. Um, to this end, the pledge has organised various initiatives aimed at raising the profile of female arbitrators in conjunction with many other organisations, um, including various meet, meet the female arbitrator events um, showcasing talented female arbitrators in different regions and sectors who may not be as well known as their male counterparts and giving participants and attendees the chance to speak to these arbitrators directly in an informal forum. Um, the pledge has also formed various regional subcommittees um, to enable implementation to take place at a more local level, which we find has enabled the pledge to reach more um, far corners of the arbitration community and for diversity efforts, efforts to be focused to the needs of a particular region or a particular group. Um, for example, in addition to the regional subcommittees, we also have a um, corporate subcommittee and young practitioners subcommittee. Um, one implementation initiative worth mentioning here, I think, is um, talking when talking about parties is the pledge corporate guidelines, which were drafted and launched by the pledges corporate subcommittee. Um, this subcommittee was formed to address the clear trend evident from the statistics that parties appoint fewer female arbitrators compared to the institutions. Um, for example, the ICA task force report on diversity in arbitration last year reported that while 34% of institutional appointments were female in 2019, only 13.9% of party appointments were. The corporate guidelines are designed to help corporate parties to implement the pledge by identifying specific steps that they can take within their organisations to improve diversity in arbitration, um, in particular during the arbitration selection process. Um, the guidelines recognise that parties often rely heavily on advice from their external counsel, but note the valuable role they can play in, in requesting external counsel take into account diversity um, and, and the pledge, which many law firms have signed up to when compiling arbitrator li candidate lists and finding the best candidates on an equal opportunity basis. One of the most common pieces of feedback that we get in relation to the pledge, especially from corporate signatories, um, relates to the desire to appoint diverse arbitrators, um, but the difficulty in accessing information about the lesser known candidates, or those with whom they have no direct experience. It's all very well looking, um, you know, on paper at someone's CV, but without that direct experience, I think it's often difficult to move from the arbitrator candidate list to, to actually being appointed. Um, parties in particular, but also external counsel, especially at smaller law firms, are just less familiar with the pool of arbitrator candidates than say the institutions and have less resources at their fingertips. Um, arbitrator intelligence is um, arbitrator reports um, are an excellent way to fill this um, information gap, which is why this diversity campaign is so warmly supported by the pledge. 
Um, and on that note, the pledge, it's worth mentioning, the pledge also offers a female arbitrator search service, um, which has been available for a few years, but is not widely used um, at the moment. So we're really trying to promote it. Um, but users struggling to find female arbitrator candidates meeting their required criteria can submit a pledge via the, um, sorry, submit a request to the pledge search committee via the website, um, who will send back a list of candidates meeting the criteria within 48 hours. It's a totally confidential service, um, and there are now about 20 institutions signed up um, to participate in the search committee from a wide range of um, geographical regions. Um, we see this as one way to help the wider arbitration community tap into the expertise, expertise and knowledge of the institutions um, that they're building in, in sort of identifying diverse candidates. I think that's probably enough um, from me on the pledges initiatives, but happy to take any questions. I mean, thank you very much. It is never enough, but it's definitely plenty. And congratulations on, on all the great work. It's obviously, um, it, it has become a commonplace synonym for progress, you know, what the Arab Pledge has done. So we are very happy to hear this direct experience from you. But this may be a, a good place to tap into uh, Dana's um, experiences and thoughts on, on all of this. Maybe if you could reflect on what has been done, what you have seen in arbitral women, uh, but then also how do you think uh, this direct feedback that Ashley has referred to as a common inquiry from, from council who are interested maybe in diverse arbitrators but wouldn't dare appoint somebody without more information. So how do you think this could play into uh, the work of arbitral women, for example? So our virtual women, as, as I mentioned at a high level earlier, really tries to raise the visibility and profile of well-qualified women in the international arbitration community. And we do that in a number of ways. Um, so, so that others who don't know who are the qualified women can find them. So one of the ways that we do it is through our member news. And I have to give a shout out to Shireen, who is a, a a key, if not <laughs> the central uh, player in, in compiling member news um, and helping us share the achievements and promotions and, um, and other qualifications of our members uh, with the wider arbitration community. So what we do is we issue news alerts in which the member news is included and then we put that on social media and we also post it on our website. So that allows people searching for women with certain qualifications to learn about them. Um, and I'll just put the link in the chat as I'm a habitual chat link person. Uh, another thing we do is um, we regularly issue newsletters and that features um, events that are held around the world that include women as uh, speakers, but both, all diverse speakers, not just women. It features initiatives in the workplace to promote gender and other kinds of diversity. It usually features an interview with a, a female arbitrator or leading figure in the arbitration community to share more information about that, that person so that they can be recognized. Um, and, uh, and then we also, have event reports that are submitted by anyone, it doesn't have to be a member, um, about events in the international arbitration community. And that allows people to see who are the speakers at events, what are they speaking on, it's substantive events and different kinds of um, arbitration work, you know, uh, whether it's an energy topic or, you know, uh, a, a diversity topic. We do both substantive and diversity um, events, and we encourage everyone to to uh, to submit event reports. So our newsletters are really um, a resource that are always available to you and on our website. So um, that's something that I, I encourage you to look at. If you're looking for diverse women, um, you'll find information about them in our newsletters. Um, finally, I would also mention that we have, it's a little bit different from the um, pledge, but we have what is sort of a search function. And that is a, a way of searching our members directory for specific qualifications that they have um, 
if it's a language skill, if it's civil law versus common law, if it's a geographic presence, if it's experience in you know, energy disputes or construction disputes, or if they serve as experts, quantum experts, um, you can search um, through using the search function drop down menu um, to find women who have the capabilities that you are looking for. And if you don't find the women in the drop down menus or for whatever reason, you know, you, it doesn't come up, um, that's a reflection in part of members maybe not having fully populated their own bio on our website. So all of you who are members, you know, Merez would be um, devastated if I didn't ask you all here now, update your bios on our website. We cannot do it for you. That's not allowed under GDPR. You need to update your bios and let us know what your skill set is and we, we can make that accessible to the world. Um, but even if you don't populate your bio, which you should, um, sometimes people reach out to members of the board just separately and say, we are looking for someone with these qualifications. And um, I know that our co-founders, uh, Merez Philippe and Louise Barrington have been regularly um, approached when someone's looking for an arbitrator or an expert or somebody qualified um, in a niche area with specific qualifications. And if they don't know the people, they reach out to the rest of the board and we work together to try to find um, the kinds of people that you are looking for. So um, those are some of the ways that Arbitral Women um, does try to promote women um, through our website and our news things. Um, and a final event, a final aspect of it is that we do host a number of events and our events team, you know, I, I can't praise them enough for all the work they do uh, to try to um, feature women who are highly qualified and allow them to be recognized by the community. And so not only do we include event reports in the newsletters that memorialize forever that these events happened and featured our, our members and women and diverse members of the arbitration community, um, but we also have on our website um, a section that is dedicated to sort of memorializing and celebrating the events that we've been involved in organizing. And so um, I, I put a few more of those in the chat and turn it over to other people to speak. But our website is actually a really a wealth of information about qualified women. And I, I don't think that our, our organization is unique in that. I certainly know that the Pledge has a very rich organization uh, website as well. And I, I actually went to your website and put some of that in the chat today too. <laughs> So um, all of these organizations and, and the representatives who you are hearing from today are one of many, and it is the full team that contributes to the work that we do, and that is accessible to all um, in, in different ways on, on the internet and in social media. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dana. And many resources have been shared, so there's a lot to look into. But like you just said, the same thing like the Arbitral Women um, membership site. If you don't give the information, there is no information. So even people who have the opportunity to give information about themselves need to be more conscious of the importance of presenting and making yourself visible. But this is also a message to everybody else who has something good to share about other arbitrators that they can give feedback and can make this information visible. So if you want to see somebody uh, who is a good practitioner or arbitrator promoted, then we need this information from you. We cannot uh, see it from your eyes and from your face. We need to know, we need to get the concrete information. That, so that's a very uh, common theme apparently, even when people have the opportunity to uh, promote themselves. So a lot has been said about uh, gender diversity. A lot has been said about supporting women either directly or indirectly. But there are also very important movements now towards making effective changes in racial and national and ethnic and you know um, age diversity as well. So we would love to hear from Eva, for example, uh, about the efforts of uh, racial equality for arbitration lawyers. Um, how do you think, first of all, what are the, some of the highlights and the activities you have been doing? But also, how do you see the, the trends moving forward? Is there progress and what do we need to do? 
Um, thank you. Uh, many thanks to Arbitration Intelligence for organizing this uh, excellent uh, panel and uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, so uh, I'm here in my capacity as uh, the Vice Chair for Scholarships of the Community Building, Networking and Scholarship uh, Committee of Real. Uh, actually, we are quite new in our uh, roles and we, uh, we are now at the moment that we just finalized our uh, next two years plans. So th this, um, I, I will share with you some of the highlights of our uh, initiatives and, and plans for the next two years. Um, I'm actually very happy because I um, am proud because I lead one of the most successful uh, real initiatives until now uh, because we have given almost 60 scholarships, which is, I think, uh, a really uh, big number for, for a new organization. And um, uh, the core objectives of, um, uh, of my committee uh, are to uh, develop uh, networking, scholarships. Uh, we have a work experience program in our plans. Um, of course, uh, developing uh, regional chapters uh and uh, expanding uh, our membership uh, list uh and uh, helping uh, 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 diverse uh, uh, candidates to uh, get potential speaking opportunities um concerning uh, disparities in arbitrate in uh, arbitrator appointments i uh, i can uh, say a few words uh, uh, regarding uh, the specific uh, committee because we have a, a committee uh, on, on arbitral appointments and um, I would say that uh, there are three uh, pillars that uh, this uh, committee uh, uh, plans to concentrate its uh, efforts. Uh, the first one is uh, research and uh, the, uh, we are planning to uh, conduct a survey uh, seeking to capture and track diversity in, in a broader sense, uh, defining diversity in, in, uh, a bro uh, as broad way as possible. Uh, then uh, an, another pillar is education and tutoring and um, um, uh, uh, we are considering uh, of uh, a pledge focusing on arbitral appointments of uh, diverse, racially diverse candidates uh, and tutoring real members um, in, on issues such as how to receive their first appointment, uh, how to be included in lists of arbitrators, how to form connections, uh, how to draft uh, an attractive uh, CV, etc. And uh, the third pillar is the promotion of diverse arbitrators. And we know how hard it is uh, for uh, young prospective arbitrators to actually get uh, their first appointment or even get appointed uh, as a tribunal secretary. This is also hard. And uh, the objective is to, uh, to help these members, uh, our members, promote themselves uh, with uh, several initiatives uh, like uh, identifying events where they could uh, promote them themselves, uh, collaborate with uh, plat platforms such as arbitrator, arbitrator intelligence, of course, and other platforms of arbitral institutions as mentioned earlier and um, yes I, th I think these these are uh, our basic uh, plans for the next two years and uh, i'd be happy to uh, to get questions mm -hmm. thank you very much eva i'm sure our participants have many questions loaded um, and also we see in the chat that um, 
our male allies have been uh, active as well. Uh, hello, Alvaro. Thank you very much for your support. Um, generally, it seems that there is a concerted effort also in real to support so these scholarships to give people that little edge that they might be missing and uh, sometimes don't have anywhere to turn to get it. So hearing about these scholarships and the success of this activity uh, is very, very um, encouraging as well. So now, uh, finally, we have Victoria here with us with, from the Raising Arbitrator uh, Initiative. And you are dealing with one of the hardest tasks, like Eva just mentioned, actually, you know, how do you get across that threshold? How do you get that first appointment uh, and, you know, from the shortlist to the panel as well? So we'll be uh, very interested in hearing what you have identified as the key entry points and how do you support young um, practitioners to become arbitrators? Uh, thank you so much, Fahira, and uh, thank you so much, Arbitrators Intelligence, for organizing this event. Uh, probably maybe just a brief background of the Rising Arbitrators, Arbitrators Initiative since it was formed in 2020, and probably most people or maybe a few people don't know about it. So uh, I am an executive committee member of the Rising Arbitrators Initiative, uh, which I usually like to refer in short as RAI, but many people would call it different ways. So um, the RAI was actually um, formed in uh, at the end of 2020 uh, by three co-founders, um, Ana, Ana Gardo de Borja, Alexander Leventhal, and Rocio Dijon. So the purpose of RAI is to seek to support arbitration practitioners under the age of 45 who have already received their first appointment as arbitrator or have at least seven years of professional experience in the practice of international arbitration uh, by creating a support network and encouraging best practices. So we the, the, the RISE mission is carried out by the executive committee and ad, an advisory council. We have Dana here, one of the... Um, members of the advisory council and many other uh, notable arbitrators who are known in the field. Uh, our leadership, if you could see on our website, is uh, actually shows a diverse background. So the main um, right aims to support the rising arbitrators by engaging in a series of activities. Maybe I could just give but a few uh, the major ones that we actually talk about more often. So we hold informal uh, members meetings and conversations on, on those issues, probably at this time with the COVID, we do a lot of webinars on that. So we have uh, members of, members only webinars, uh, where we do trainings, uh, we could do trainings in how you know how to calculate damages, things that a new arbitrator or, or someone who has not yet gotten their first appointed would wish to know as an upcoming arbitrator. We also organize, um, in the same capacity of organizing open events, panel discussions. Uh, we also seek to create a network to support rising arbitration, arbitrators in relation to the practicalities acting, of acting as an arbitrator. And we are, we are also seeking to provide a platform of publishing articles and academic works. So just to note, um, since our inception in 2020, we have received a you know, application to join uh, as members of the Rising Arbitrators. And just to give you um, uh, the categories of professionals that we have at the Rising Arbitrators Initiative, we have in-house councils, we have case council, case managers of arbitral institutions, investment managers of third party funding firms, academics, government officials, solo arbitrators, lawyers, and professional uh, support knowledge management professionals and law firms. Uh, doctoral students, legal assistants, uh, secretaries to arbitrators. So you can actually see that the membership is quite diverse. So we do, it is our hope that uh, this professional diversity helps minimize uh, the gap in diverse arbitrator appointments through their participation in various activities organized by RAI. Uh, when it comes to, uh, in, 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 when it comes to just to the membership I've just mentioned, so I'm referring to um, statistics carried out in the application cycle between 16th September 2020 and 21st July 2021. So we received a total number of uh, approximately 350 application and you can just see uh, the geographical representation are from probably 69 from Asia, 6 from Australia, 49 from Latin America, 152 from Europe, uh, 54 from North America, 20 from Africa. So you can actually see the diverse in the membership. Uh, 
So we had actually, we just closed uh, the application cycle. It was on 15th of September and we hope that we received, um, we'll, we'll, we'll keep give, giving our statistics of how we're doing in membership. So um, now what kind of activities are we doing so that we ensure, probably let me just give a few examples uh, uh, considering time. So uh, we have, um, we have had our couple of webinar series. Number one, let me just give the one that I actually actively participated in. So it was a webinar series titled The Rising Arbitrators Challenge and Navigating the Promise and Perils of Your First Appointment, carried, which was carried out all over the continent. We had, represent, we had uh, the series in Europe, in Africa, in the Americas, and I was in charge of the Africa. And I was, it was quite interesting. We saw, uh, I mean, we saw a huge participation and actually we realized young arbitrators really want to know what is going on. And, and considering that I've just mentioned before the professional diversity, you can see if you, you have such people attending, then they are able to know like what needs to be done to encourage diversity. And uh, one of the things that I actually was very, I was very impressed by uh, one of the activities um, that was carried out by Rai um, is carrying out a webinar series with institutions. Uh, institutions are very great helpers in terms of diversity. So it was called, it was titled uh, Interview with the Institution. So whereby Rai Executive Committee members and the Advisory Council interviewed with several arbitral institutions globally. For example, myself, I interviewed with the chairperson, chairperson of LASIAC, uh, Mrs. Akerodolu. And I think one of the questions that we actually made sure to get statistics from these institutions, what are they doing so far to ensure diversity? And one of the questions that I asked was, are there any specific measures you take to ensure diversity in appointment of arbitration, arbitrators, age, sex, age, nationality, nationality and its ethnicity? So we received great feedback and probably uh, my thinking at that time was that when you, whenever you ask that, such questions, if an institution is not making a move at that time, then they would actually be encouraged to keep doing something that would encourage uh, the promotion of diversity in institutions, being the great helpers of uh, the promotion of di diversity in arbitra arbitrary appointments. So uh, those uh, interviews were recorded. Uh, we, you can check them out at our website, www.risingarbitratorsinitiative.com. And uh, another thing that we do so far, and I, I, I'm, really pleases my heart is um, we've started just recently started a tradition of posting our members on LinkedIn, you know, and uh, giving a, a brief description about them, who they are. These are young arbitrators who are 45 and below and trying to, you know, market them to them. And I, I've seen a lot of traction. I've seen people commenting, people encouraging them, people liking their, um, the, you know, the posts and such kind of uh, situations. So I think as Rai, we do, we cannot say we do one thing, we do a lot. We do, so long as we are uh, participating, we're making sure that you are out there, people get to know about you. And also we do uh, associate with institutions like uh, the, the, the arbitrator intelligence, like right now, supporting these uh, conversations and make sure that uh, the platform is there for people to, 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 to be able to showcase their, ex their speciality or the expertise. So that is something that I, I'm really passionate about. And I think being an executive committee of member of RAI gives me that platform. And uh, I am pleased that Arbitrator Intelligence is continuing with this conversation. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure other organizations represented here, uh, like Arbitral Women, uh, ERA, and all these other institutions will be the greatest platform uh, before us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's all very encouraging and very impressive. And it's wonderful to hear that we are all joined in the in these efforts. So, you know, all of you have been doing amazing things separately. Now, imagine all of this energy being channeled into making these uh, young, diverse uh, arbitrators actually visible and, and available for appointments. We are very short on time right now, but I feel so uplifted and I'm sure all of our audience is as well. So we have been open this whole time for questions, of course. We invite you again uh, now to either um, raise your hand or write in the question and answer or in the chat. But in the meantime, while we were doing that, uh, to close and to make sure we come out with a good message, maybe uh, Shireen can uh, ask a little short survey question. And this will apply both for the audience, but also for our participants. So let's see. 
Yes, we, we only have five minutes left, so we'll, we'll four minutes now. So we'll be very, very brief. Um, let's think about everything that has been contributed today, all of the things that we heard from each of the institutions and organizations. Thinking of all of that, what is the one aspect that you think, uh, panelists, but also audience members, that most contributes to furthering diverse appointments um, across the field of international arbitration? You can type your uh, response in the chat. Um, uh, the panelists, if, you, if people want to say in one or two words, no more, uh, we could do a quick round table of who, um, what is the one word or the one thing that you think most contributes? So why don't we start with, I'll just go around the screen as I see it, uh, Ashley from ERA Pledge. I would say um, diversity needs to be sort of a, you know, conscious and sort of as one of the fa factors that people are taking into account when they're considering arbitrator appointments. Um, it's no good just sort of supporting it in principle. Um, it needs conscious and deliberate action during the process. Thank you. Victoria. Uh, personally, I would say it's uh, experience and training. I think that would, would, would be one of the things that people consider, like, and how you've marketed yourself quite well, how, how people know you, because you might have all this great resume, but if you have not put yourself in a platform that people would know your work, that would not, that would not really be, I mean, you would not be at a, at a position whereby you say, okay, well, diversity has been met. Thank you, Dana. I think it's dispelling the myth, the myth that many clients or counsel have that choosing a diverse arbitrator is taking a risk on quality and showing that there are many talented diverse arbitrators, counsel experts and others out there. And that it's not a risk, but it's actually an asset and really embracing that, proving that to the international arbitration community and, and with that, giving confidence to clients and to the board that it is the right choice to choose diverse arbitrators, council, and, and other members of the community. Thank you. Katarina. As for me, the one word would be information. So this information, the spelling of it uh, would raise the awareness because it's very easy to go with the flow as it is now. Some people don't even think about this, but when you uh, really get to know about the statistics information that can fly, uh, you can uh, change this uh, flow to the more equal one. So I would say this would help. Thank you. Obaro. Yeah, if I may uh, say something, I think uh, it's to the arbitrators and mediators that they shouldn't just rely on the institutions for, you know, visibility. You should do all you can to put yourself out there because hard work sells itself. And of course, in anything you're doing, be it uh, in your practice as a lawyer, you should be diligent because hard work, you know, sells itself anywhere. That's what I would say. Thank you. Eva? Um, yes, I, I agree about uh, knowledge and awareness. I think the, the most key aspect is the knowledge that more diverse panels uh, can lead to better decision making overall. Thank you. Navruza? So I would like to echo Victoria's words. So I think uh, visibility is important. So uh, yes, arbitrators might have done a lot of things in their resume, but if parties have, have not seen them, so this might be a problem. So, and uh, they might become the members of various um, institutions, uh, movements and etc. and just try to show them as much as possible. Thank you. And Michelle. Uh, so many good things said, what's left? Um, <laughs> but I think for me, one, one big thing is we have to recognize the role of implicit biases um, and then be very proactive about countermeasures. Um, so, you know, understanding the way the implicit biases are affecting the choices that we're making um, and then forcing us to look beyond, you know, the, the short list that we already have at the top of our heads with respect to who the best fit for this case is going to be. 
Thank you. And of course, in the chat, we also see council and parties buy in. And I do want to give a, a last word to Catherine before Fahira, Fahira uh, closes us out to uh, contribute, of course, her thoughts on this uh, critical issue. I'm going to, you know, I should say arbitrary intelligence reports are such an important thing, but I'm going to go uh, against the typecast and say, especially as I'm listening to all these groups here, I'm going to make a reflection on the on the diversity movement. I think 10, 15 years ago, certainly when Mirez was was in and and her associates early on were really trying to, I think diversity groups or diverse arbitrators and, and practitioners were knocking at the doors of power. Um, we're trying to convince the gatekeepers to let everyone in, to give them a seat at the table, to mix my metaphors. And I think now uh, what's evidenced in these groups is that we've taken control of our own destinies with regard to diversity. And we are the change makers. We're not asking uh, the gatekeepers to make change for us. So I wanted to congratulate all the groups on, I think, demonstrating that, right? And that's a really huge shift in the diversity movement, I think. Um, and I, so I guess if I had to sum it up about what's the most important thing, I, did, I think it is this collaborative effort. Um, and I think it's all these things working together. So with that, I'll also just give my own thanks to everyone one more time before I turn it back over. So thanks all for being here. Thank you. Thank for you hearing. so much. Yes. Thank you, Shereen. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you all. Um, some of the words that you have said, I mean, all of them do resonate, but some of them have a very common theme, and that is we have to work together, we have to collaborate, we all have to contribute, and we all have to contribute consciously. So uh, all of this resonates very well, I'm sure, with all of our attendees. Um, thank you all again. So once again, we will just like to close with a call to action. So if you are an institution, please recommend to the parties to provide feedback on arbitrators. Please leverage the information that is available to make your lists more diverse. When you are an appointing authority, please leverage this information to make more diverse appointments. If you're a party or council, look into the available sources, look into the information that's available and contribute to that information. Because today you are the one giving the information, tomorrow you will be the one taking somebody else's feedback for your own appointment. So it's really a community effort. It's a, it's a very uh, valuable chain of support. So hopefully uh, next year when we speak about these issues, we can talk about even more tangible uh, changes that have happened in this area. But once again, hats off to all of you. Uh, thank you to all of our speakers, panelists, uh, all of our supporting organizations, institutions, all the participants who have been with us on a late afternoon or even evening. We are available uh, always if you have any questions. If you want to provide feedback, please feel free. Um, uh, Shireen has shared our AIQ questionnaire online. You can also schedule a call. You can email us and give us feedback in a, in a video or phone call. So we are available and we are waiting to hear about these amazing diverse arbitrators. So with that, thank you all very much. Have a wonderful day, evening, and we will be in touch. One last, a very, very quick word. I just did an AIQ the other day by telephone and it's super easy. So I can, I really encourage colleagues to uh, take the opportunity. It takes a few minutes and it's, it's really an enormous contribution to the field. So consider it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all.